Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Howard. And also thank you, Paige and, and Rita, for um, your fantastic job in putting uh, this, uh, this meeting together. Um, so uh, being number one, I guess, is, uh, I guess we will uh, set the pace for um, uh, the panel discussions. I, I would like to say that um, this area of evidence, uh, what I, I think about um, is that what we're really seeking are the paths or the pathways to truth, a ground truth, as, as much as we can define it, about the value that genomic information has in the care uh, of, our, of our patients. And speaking of patients, I, I think uh, patients with a C is something that we probably all probably need to have in this arena. Um, uh, I, I, er, I know that everybody in this room wants to see the impact of the work that they've been doing um, in their lifetime. Uh, but I, I think this is a long journey, um, and I think we're learning about the length of that journey through uh, the work that this, uh, this, this very important work that all of these groups are doing. So I, I think it's uh, an exercise of, of patience to make sure that we actually, <coughs> excuse me, get it right, because I think that's the most important thing. I think if we screw up, um, uh, the consequences will be uh, enormous. Um, so space block, right? No? No space block. Arrow? Arrow? No arrow. <laughs> um, any, other, any other keys that I should be pressing? I tried that once. Eric? Ah! Uh, try um, eject. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, we're getting closer. Another? Space bar? Arrow? Down arrow? Right arrow? Left arrow? Space bar. Oh, there we go. Okay. I think that last one it was a space bar, but it had to uh, it had to learn my touch, I think, or something like that. Uh, so I am. Um, I think it's terrific to have a panel uh, that we have today. Um, uh, the names of my colleagues are here. So Jonathan Berg from um, University of North Carolina, uh, um, who is, runs the uh, clinical cancer and adult genetics clinics there, and is involved in several NHGRI projects. Um, we're really honored to have Pierre Moulin here, who's the uh, President and CEO of Genome Canada, and um, uh, uh, also um, grateful for Guerbernit um, Randewat um, from ARC, uh, sharing his experience in, in evidence uh, generation. Um, I think actually one thing this panel highlights is the fact that uh, despite the, uh, the myths that uh, Duke and UNC are, are rivals with one another, this panel highlights the fact that we can actually collaborate, and there's all actually a number of collaborations that, are crossing, uh, that take place across the great uh, divide in North Carolina uh, academically. But I feel like I need to remind you that we did win the NCAA basketball championships this year. Um, so in sports, um, uh, uh, no such thing. So I don't know if any of you were uh, reading the New York Times yesterday, but in the Sunday Review section, I, I caught this uh, article uh, how um, uh, the theoretical physics community is, is actually in its own evidence uh, debate. And the question is how much empirical evidence is needed to prove theories that have been in existence for, for decades or even uh, perhaps a, a century or more. Um, but I thought this quote, quote in the op-ed piece was actually um, highly relevant to what we're talking about today. Our most ambitious science can seem at odds with the empirical methodology that has historically given the field its credibility. So there's a true balance I think we need to be cognizant of as we uh, think about uh, the question of evidence. So why do we need evidence for the impact, uh, to, uh, for genomic medicine to proceed and achieve its impact? Well, I think it's simply because we practice evidence-based medicine. And I have a picture here of David Sackett, who is known as the father of evidence-based medicine. He passed away uh, within the last month and was revered for his contributions to creating uh, this paradigm by which um, um, medicine around the world is currently practiced. But of course, uh, the kinds of evidence we need, we have to get into the details of, of clinical validity, clinical utility that um, inform eventually the development of guidelines that are the benchmark by which clinicians practice medicine every day, and that the adoption of those, uh, of the practice of genomic medicine will require some infiltration of the evidence that we're talking about here. Uh, into those guidelines. We want patients to advocate for the kinds of uh, genomic medicine technologies and innovations we're talking about, so the evidence from their perspective is, is quite uh, important. And as we'll discuss, I think, at greater length, the, the payers 
and the regulators are going to um, play critical roles in, uh, in the evidence discussions and how um, uh, regulatory approval and reimbursement is achieved. And then uh, well, a, a notion that we'll come to in a few moments is the notion of pre-implementation evidence as a gateway to um, uh, the broader evidence generation that will ultimately impact uh, dissemination. So I think it was uh, the CDC in about 10 years ago, or at least I became, first became aware of this uh, evidentiary framework from the CDC about 10 years ago, uh, probably was associated with EGAP. Uh, people associated with EGAP would know better than I. Uh, that, um, well, that's not really projecting very well, I'm, I apologize. But uh, the word analytic validity should be uh, um, uh, projected on the, on the, on the uh, second circle in, at the, in the lower right-hand quadrant. Um, but it's clear that uh, different groups have taken ownership, uh, different stakeholders have taken ownership of the evidentiary framework. So we have uh, groups like uh, uh, CMS and CLIA uh, focused on, uh, on the laboratories and uh, the ability to achieve analytic validity that the, does it, that the test is, is reproducible and precise and robust. Uh, and the FDA and, and, uh, has taken uh, some ownership of clinical validity along with analytic validity. That is, the test actually correlates well and is associated with a clinical characteristic or phenotype. And certainly the payers and the, um, and the provider and to some extent the patient community are embracing clinical utility, which is another way of saying does, the, does performing this test lead to an action that actually improves uh, healthcare outcomes. And while there are a number of elements of this framework, I guess the question that we will be asking today is uh, how do we get alignment of what the actual goals for evidence are across this continuum from analytic validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility? And can we engage this community uh, in this important discussion? So I mentioned this earlier, um, and it just, uh, again, a question that we discussed in our, in our group prior to this meeting uh, has to do with the fact that um, there has to be a threshold in which you make a decision to actually test whether a genetic or genomic test is going to actually be something useful to generate more evidence about. So what is that pre-implementation uh, evidence or preliminary evidence needed to uh, put this into implementation science research? And then, then what is the evidentiary threshold um, that is targeted for a widespread dissemination and perhaps uh, adoption? Uh, so there's not just one kind of evidence uh, we would posit. Uh, there are several kinds, and it's this community, I think, has to make some decisions, uh, not completely sure who decides which evidence, whether evidence has reached a pre-implementation phase. I, I would argue that an evidence by uh, G GM1, in which a lot of local groups were making decisions to implement in the absence of any type of national consensus or global consensus uh, amongst the expertise in this room, for sure. And when we discussed our, uh, the evidence questions within our, our group for the meeting, we also thought that not only, that evidence also needs to be contextualized for the decisions uh, that it's being used to inform. Um, and as again, I'll, uh, I've alluded to this already, but how do we align the expectations between the scientific community that's generating the evidence, the individuals that are actually evaluating what that evidence means from the payer provider um, um, and patient perspective, um, and gather that community in a way that, um, that achieves the alignment to, to create the most efficient processes for evidence generation. I think a concept that we also want to touch on at some point is personal, personal utility, because that's what really is what, a, what the patients might be seeing most uh, from the evidentiary frameworks that, 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 uh, that emerge. Uh, so these are just some examples uh, that our group uh, came up with for just giving a sense of the context. And, and I'm, I know this is debatable, and we can, have, uh, we can have a discussion around this. It's not the point. But if you're going to uh, put a, a genomic screening test uh, for population and public health into action, uh, you want to ensure that the, um, that the, the characteristics of the test are uh, almost uh, immutable, uh, that the sensitivity is high, and that its action, impact following action is really going to have significant impacts on public health. So the bar for evidence of, uh, for genomic screening could arguably be very high. Same could be said for selecting, uh, using genomic testing as the basis for selecting an, uh, an, not only an expensive, potentially expensive 100K per year type of um, molecular uh, targeted therapy, 
but also one that might um, be critically important for a single decision that a patient has a, around their mortality from a disease. So the evidentiary threshold might be quite high there as well, whereas in other situations um, where the risk of, of the risks associated with uh, making the wrong decision uh, could arguably be tolerable and, and uh, less impactful, uh, the bar could be lower. So around uh, the use of genetic risk testing to modify behavior or to maybe um, optimize uh, pain control um, for patients uh, at the end of life. Uh, maybe that's a medium bar. I don't know. But, it's, but I think it, the point is just to kind of contextualize these, uh, these decisions. So this is a, an evidence matrix that we've been actually working with at Duke and as part of our IGNITE project, uh, which actually looks at um, many dimensions of evidence from the patient, provider, and even the health system point of view, and also expands the dimensionality, as you can see, vertically into not only clinical evidence, but molecular, behavioral, emotional, and financial. I guess I would argue that the vast majority of clinical studies mainly use the upper left-hand box as endpoints, that we focus mainly on the, on the changes in clinical characteristics, which is our comfort zone, perhaps, and maybe where we have the greatest tools. Uh, maybe there are some in the, in the lower right-hand corner when we do cost-effective or cost-utility analyses, but I think um, our goal in creating this matrix and also uh, as part of this discussion is to, is to really think a little bit outside of those boxes into ways that we can derive evidence that clearly um, has useful and that um, arguably even the provider community has been largely omitted uh, from the endpoints that we design in our clinical studies. We also recognized in our discussions, um, and I'm sure you have, is that the, uh, the infrastructure that's necessary for evidence generation is, is really um, a large part of it could be a leverage from the clinical community um, with the advent of a number of health IT solutions. Um, to bring genetic and genomic information into EMRs, at least in a small, uh, at least in a, an initial way. Um, the use of a, a variety of technologies which are allowing patients to, to report their outcomes uh, is becoming increasingly important. And, and again, um, finding that uh, sort of a sweet spot in the Venn diagram of clinical uh, care and clinical research to leverage the, uh, the activities of a health system as a way to also be uh, an evidence uh, generation engine. So who is the addressing this topic across the spectrum of uh, NHGRI programs? I've, I list some of them here. Um, I'm not going to go through them. A lot of them Terry mentioned in her opening remarks. And I really applaud the, um, the thinking behind developing this matrix. But as, uh, as, as we discussed it amongst our group, um, I got a lot of pushback by trying to identify which of the NHGRI communities we're actually contributing to evidence, because uh, I think there's a lot of discussion and debate about which of these activities are actually evidence-generating activities, among other things. But I would say a vision for where we want to be at the end of this meeting is to think about how do we organize um, all the rich talent and data that is being generated across the multitude of programs represented by all of you into a, um, a consortium of consortiums or something that we, uh, some, by some mechanism that allows us to really pool the kinds of evidence that we're generating and, and, and leverage the uh, strengths and, uh, into synergies that will uh, be evidence promoting. So the next couple of slides are gaps and barriers, and I don't want to be too, make, it, make it too depressing because there are many. Um, and, uh, and I'm not going to go through them in any great detail. I hope this is the richness of our discussion that will happen uh, after uh, I'm done speaking. But the first one is a simple conundrum or paradox is that to implement, uh, you need evidence. And to generate evidence, you need implementation. So there's a, there's a, there's a problem there or a challenge there we need to solve. And I, I highlighted it earlier with um, uh, the pre-implementation uh, uh, evidentiary threshold idea. Um, I think um, many of us would agree uh, that RCTs and traditional clinical trials are efficacy studies, but generate, uh, seldom generate the kind of evidence for real-world implementation. And I'm really pleased uh, that a, a number of the programs uh, that are represented here in the room are actually generating real-world data in healthcare delivery systems and not uh, doing traditional um, RCTs. Um, we need to be cognizant of the 
uh, particularly in um, high dimensional data sets and the kinds of multi marker um, panels that some of us are involved in using uh, of the power and design of the studies to really achieve the notions of clinical validity and clinical utility. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk in the discussion about our, how, uh, uh, particularly in the U.S., we're, we're highly fragmented not only as healthcare delivery systems, um, as scientific organizations, institutes, even as programs in this room were pretty fragmented uh, until today. Um, and that uh, we, we need to really think about how to de-silo uh, the systems in order to achieve the optimal results, particularly with regard to evidence generation. I mentioned the HIT tools and infrastructure, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about uh, the need to uh, augment what we're already doing in terms of professional education to uh, get us to where we want to be in terms of um, evidence generation. Um, the misalignment. Uh, of the payers, opinion leaders, and I think patience is important to include in this uh, alignment strategy or alignment gap. Um, that we also um, uh, are probably not doing uh, adequate health technology assessments, particularly on the value that genomic information provides to the system. Um, actually, few studies, I would be interested in hearing more about this in, during the discussion, where where are, real, the, where are the economic analyses that are really going to convince payers or health systems to really adopt these technologies? Where are those being done in our programs, and should we be doing more of them uh, going forward? Um, I talked about the uh, need for data infrastructure uh, in clinical care and also arguably in clinical trials, uh, integration of genomics into health care, uh, electronic health records. Um, and an important gap, I think, is that a lot of health systems do quality improvement initiatives. These are often done um, because you don't need to consent patients for them. They're meant to be sort of internal evidence generating activities, but they never get published. And I think that's a real um, loss, I think, for, for our field, particularly if, if, our, if, if any of us are doing QI initiatives around genetic and genomic testing. So um, I sit on the Institute of Medicine's roundtable for translating genomic research uh, to health. And I wanted to just make the point, because industry is not represented in our discussions here, that uh, industry suffers from the lack of evidence, too. And obviously, uh, the, the, the extrapolation of that is they could be an important partner for us in this area. Um, so we have a working group in this IOM roundtable that is focused on uh, generating a slightly different kind of evidence that enables drug discovery. So. How do you move from a gene signal to full understanding of mechanism uh, that actually supports a drug development hy hypothesis? I would say the, the leaders of pharmaceutical companies are trying to pull the trigger on multi-million dollar, hundred million dollar programs on a very uh, a limited set of evidentiary um, uh, of mechanistic uh, data that supports their hypothesis. So, uh, I just wanted to make, uh, make sure that we, we capture that important stakeholder community uh, in our thinking about evidence. And um, there are a number of other thoughts here on this slide I won't go through. So I've uh, highlighted here um, some potential synergies across the programs, um, the uh, ability to, to generate a, a common measures uh, uh, a platform across uh, the programs that are making these measures to create an implementation commons that really gives us all the lessons learned and allows the next generation of studies to clearly benefit from uh, what has been done in the past. Um, thinking about uh, evidence databases, which I, I think we've, we've sort of uh, thought about conceptually, um, but maybe they, they need to actually really exist. Um, thinking about joint publications, again, across the program is a theme that I'm obviously going to make over and over again, and, and bringing in the broader stakeholder community uh, like we're doing today. Uh, in terms of training opportunities, um, uh, you know, I don't know if there's a, an actual place to go to get skills in evidence generation, but I would say uh, our genomic medicine trainees, uh, particularly in the translational space, need to really understand uh, the analytic validity, clinical validity, clinical utility issues. Uh, and a lot of the barriers that we've, we've highlighted, not just in this meeting, but in, in the past, and really have their research agendas hopefully focused on uh, addressing uh, some of those challenges, which I think leads to the possibility of, of, of linking some type of fellowship to these programs. And I'm just naming a couple here, but I can imagine that, uh, that genomic medicine fellows that actually have a very specific role 
in helping um, the expanding research agendas that I, at least I see from Ignite and I'm sure are happening in the other uh, programs, uh, uh, um, you know, would really be a huge, huge asset for us and a tremendous opportunity for them, arguably. Um, it's great to have Pierre here and think about other ways that um, forward-thinking programs like Genome Canada and uh, this one can really uh, collaborate. Um, and then perhaps even having uh, the educational uh, tools that are needed, um, not just for the trainees, but also for uh, the physicians in practice. And um, even for myself, I would learn a lot from uh, many of you that I, that I haven't yet. Uh, so that uh, leads me to uh, the discussion part of this. Um, we teed up a few questions. Uh, the first one about um, uh, really the alignment question around the uh, regulators and payers and the other stakeholders. Uh, the second one is around, um, you know, getting all of you to help us think through about how to create the right partnerships. Um, I'm not sure that bullet number three is one that will um, arrive at a conclusion for today, but it would be nice to articulate some pathway to getting to thinking about what, how to create um, a, a, a framework underneath the framework of evidence that uh, guides implementation. Um, and then the last one, which may, ha may be tied to the first, which is uh, ultimately achieving the, um, the incentives that align um, the patients, the providers, the health systems, uh, the researchers, uh, the payers, and the regulators, which is a daunting task, but something that um, inevitably has to be done. So I'm going to stop there. And um, what I thought I would do is, uh, so we're now entering the discussion phase, which means that um, all of you uh, who are looking at your computers need to look up a little higher. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, this is, um, the, the best part of this meeting is the things that you bring to it, not, certainly not me. Um, so I, this, this part of the meeting is really where we want to hear from anybody and everybody, uh, whether you're a, a PI, um, an investigator, or uh, from one of the other ICs or other organizations. It's, it, this is a, a really open uh, engagement. But I, uh, we have you know, three uh, remarkable panelists um, that have thought about this a lot, and I should say uh, they contributed enormously to the thoughts that I shared with you over the last uh, 20 minutes or so. But I thought I'd start with the first uh, question, which um, actually was a permutation of a statement that um, Pierre has made several times in our discussions over the last uh, few weeks. And I thought I'd ask him to, if, if he wouldn't mind, to just lead off, uh, you know, maybe highlighting the experience in Genome Canada or beyond that, um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, and thanks again for inviting us uh, to, to this uh, really important meeting. Um, we had a great discussion, series of discussions, uh, while we were generating uh, some of the thoughts that, that Jeff has uh, described. And so I'll, I'll be talking from, obviously, a Canadian uh, perspective here. Um, and our issue uh, was that we, we have a, in Canada, we have a terrible track record in uh, implementing any kind of new uh, technologies into the healthcare system. Um, uh, and so when we were designing the genomics and personalized health competition, that we did in partnership with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, we uh, very much thought of this idea of end-to-end -end integration. Uh, so bringing all the stakeholders together within one uh, consortium per project to try and understand uh, all of the potential roadblocks. And actually, on the slides that Jeff sh showed, 3A and B, um, uh, you know, we have all of those issues, and I think any country in the world will have the same, uh, exactly the same list, uh, totally overlapping. Um, so we designed the program saying, okay, yes, we, we know the project teams have great uh, research, uh, uh, fabulous uh, uh, clinical science uh, going on, uh, but please involve uh, health economists in your deliberations. Please involve those who are going to uh, look at the social, economic, and legal aspects of what you're doing, because there might be regulatory uh, jurisdictional hurdles that um, you're going to come across. We want to know those up front. 
So we were lucky in the, in the, uh, in the program that we were able to raise um, $150 million to, to, to run this program. Uh, it involves 17 projects that are uh, ongoing right now. We're about halfway through. And we just decided that we would build, uh, and I know some of you have been directly involved in this program, and I'm looking at Terry and Dan and Eric uh, Howard. I, I learned today that Jonathan was a reviewer, uh, and, and there are probably many others of you who have been, who have been directly involved in this program, so thank you. Um, but really to uh, try and um, uh, get that end-to-end -end kind of integration of thinking. Uh, and we're, we're just about to launch a, a network, uh, so a network of these uh, mini consortia uh, to try and learn from, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, each other in terms of uh, what, are the, what the roadblocks have been or are. So we have, uh, in Canada, the, the health delivery is a provincial uh, mandate. And currently, uh, some of the provinces are spending about 50% of their budget on healthcare delivery. And they're all saying, we can't go anymore. We cannot incre in, uh, increase that percentile uh, anymore. So help us. And so we're saying, well, technology in some instances could be uh, one solution, but obviously we have to make sure that uh, uh, we get all the evidentiary uh, stuff uh, that uh, really attracts the payer to pull this technology into the system. And not so much that the, the pushers, the scientists and clinicians are pushing something that the healthcare system say, oh, it's new technology? That's just going to be an add-on cost to our bill. No, thank you. So I think that's the th thing we're, uh, we're struggling with. Uh, I think, uh, from our perspective, there are some really key projects um, that are already actually in a lot of collaboration going on, for example, in the rare disease space. And uh, Heidi, I know, has a, uh, a good few collaborations with, uh, with Canada on this. But that's, that's a, a topic whereby um, the, it's a great model for what's going on in personalized medicine or precision medicine uh, in general, right? And the issue there is we're already bringing value to patients and families with rare diseases through uh, uh, just uh, stopping their uh, diagnostic odyssey. And, we, and we've done that with over 200 families in Canada now. But all of that impact on patients has been through research dollars and not healthcare delivery dollars. And we need to understand that interface uh, much more uh, clearly going forward. So there's a, a few comments from, from me. I, uh, I hope I didn't go on about uh, too much. And um, thank you again, Jeff, yeah. for inviting us. No, thanks, thanks Pierre. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Jonathan or wherever you need, either of you want to make comments, you do. OK, go for it. So I'll just add a couple of things. I completely agree with what Pierre has said. Um, from some of the experience that ARC has had in this area, uh, I think a couple of things that we should look at is how do we improve our research efficiency? Uh, although uh, you know, NIH, at least from ARC's viewpoint, has a tremendous budget, but it, it really can't do everything itself, as uh, you know, Eric pointed out to us earlier. We need to make sure that the research we fund is not always thought of as one-off research studies that the research funding agencies have to shoulder the burden all the time. So the question becomes, how do we leverage the ongoing transformation of healthcare delivery and see how it benefits the research enterprise? One of the things that we learned is uh, clinicians uh, are not research, as, as one can imagine, are not interested in research per se, but if they are getting information from the data systems to improve the quality of care, uh, they don't mind it being used for research given proper safeguards. So the whole bi-directionality of information proved to be critical, and that also goes into the value proposition. Uh, the other thing we should think about is sustainability. Uh, 
and engaging maybe payers early on. We've had some experience with the CMS coverage of the evidence development, but I think there are several limitations here. So can we go and improve on this notion so that when we design the research, it's done with the end user in mind? Um, I think those would be important points. Yeah. The other thing that I would just add in terms of thinking about the way that we frame all the discussions at the meeting is to, you know, going back to that ACCE framework, the, the central uh, circle in the middle specified disorder and setting. And I think that all of the evidence is really um, needing to be thought about in the context of what is the question that we're asking. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would ask whether genomic medicine necessarily always means whole genome sequencing medicine or whether genomic medicine is many different tests that we incorporate. And so thinking about the context in which we would use those tests, what, what is the purpose of that testing, whether it's from a prenatal, newborn, diagnostic, predictive, pharmacogenomic, risk prediction, all of those are very different settings. They, they require different types of evidence. They, they have different stakes in terms of how we use that information clinically. And so I think I would like to, to think about framing a lot of the questions about evidence in genomic medicine really around the context. 